welcome everyone to the kickstart event for student robotics twenty twenty three yay yeah i think the enthusiasm is welcome yes so over the next hour or what i hope to be an hour uh, we're going to run through sort of a couple of things uh, we're going to run through what is student robotics we're going to run through the schedule for the what we call year but is really october to april um, I'm going to run through some sort of tips for designing your robot. I'm going to go through some tips for building your robot and how best to do that. I'm going to go through developing your robot because it needs to think and it does that in code. Um, we're going to run through some health and safety things. And then after that, we're going to run through the game and actually tell you what it is we're doing. Um, and then we're going to run through the micro games, which is what you'll be, if you're in person, we'll be doing the rest of today. And if you are remote on the internet, then you will be able to do these. You'll be able to do part of it now and part of it when your kit actually arrives. It feels weird talking to a camera. Uh, so yes, anyway, throughout this, I'm going to be giving you quite a lot of information and it is completely natural to have questions. If you do have any questions and you are in this room, um, wait until the end. There's a nice period where you'll be able to ask tons and tons and tons of questions. And as well, if throughout the day you have other questions, you can, of course, come and find any of us in our fancy blue t-shirts and ask us said questions. If you're remote, post them in the chat and we'll get to them. As well, if you're in Discord, you can ask them in there and we'll have plenty of people to come in and um, ask them. And as well, they'll get, if they're happening throughout the presentation, they'll get relayed to me by our crack live stream team. So what is Student Robotics? Presumably you're here for some reason. Um, we are a UK-based charity with the mission of bringing the excitement of engineering and the challenge of coding to young people through robotics. And the way we do this is through running a autonomous robotics competition for teams aged roughly 16 to 19 in a sort of annual competition format of which this is the start and the end will end up in April. Student Robotics being a charity, we are run entirely by volunteers. We give up our free times to be here to make this all possible. Um, there are lots of us. Some of us are in this room. Some of us you will have met downstairs and there are many more in various parts of the world, really. Um, and even more than they're in this picture. Um, and we're here to help. We're here to make sure that you get the best experience out of this um, sort of competition period possible and make sure you have sort of the most fun, the most learning and sort of everything else that comes with that. So. As for the teams, um, obviously there are a number of you in this room, but in the actual competition this year, there are 34 of you. Um, that's quite a few. Um, without teams competing in a competition, it wouldn't really be much of a competition. We'd turn up to a building, set up an arena, tear it down and go home. Not very fun. So like I say, we're, whilst we're a UK-based charity, we're not not all our teams are in the UK. As we can see, sort of most of them are, and there is definitely a very strong cluster in the south of England, but there are sort of some further north um, and as well sort of not just in the UK, we also have Team MAI in Munich and we also have uh, another team in Guernsey whose team name I can't quite remember. Oh, the Ladies College Guernsey, that's the one, yes. 34 of you, lots of names, lots to remember. So. What does a competition actually look like? Um, this is a video from last year. Um, this is the grand final of the event. And if my mouse ends up on the right screen, I can show you sort of what that's gonna look like. Um, I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but. Uh, yes, yeah, so the aim of this game, just to give a little bit of overview, is the idea is to get it's weird talking over my own voice. I'm gonna dim that a little bit. Um, the idea was to collect these cans and bring them back into your, um, into your starting zone. And the idea from that was that then the more cans you get, the more points you get, the more points you get, you win. Um, and there was the added bonus of, as we can see, there are like red tape rings around the cans. That's signifying the bottom of them. So lots of them are upside down. And if you flip them the right way up, you get even more points. Um, and so, yes, this is sort of what a competition looks like. This was the final competition last year, so proper competition arena, competition everything. This is the kind of robots you'll be building, the kind of size and stuff like that, but I'll get on to the details of those later. Um, 
and yeah, like I said, we're not gonna watch the whole thing. Um, it is on our YouTube channel if you do want to go and find it, wanna watch the whole thing, as well as the full live stream from the last, I think, three or four years is all up there as well if you want to be particularly nosy. That's just skipping, isn't it? There we go. So what is this year actually gonna look like? So as we know, sort of right at the moment, you are in Kickstart. Um, we are fairly close to Christmas, but not so close that we need to start talking about it. Um, between sort of now and the competition in April, we will have a number of tech days. And what tech days are is a chance for you to actually come into a room with a bunch of blue shirts, a bunch of other teams, and sort of spend a whole day working on your robot. Um, we do tend to find these are quite... For those on the live stream, the one team we were waiting for have just turned up. Wow, that's a lot of people. So, for the sake of Hills Road, I'm going to do the very quick run through of what we've just done. We've talked about who student robotics are, we've had a very quick look at what the finals of last year looked like, and I'm going to get into what the rest of the year looks like. Um, if you have any questions on that bit that, I've, that you've missed, um, either ask at the end or ask David Matty, who's also one of our trustees. Anyway, um, like I was saying, there are tech days, which are a chance for you to actually come to a venue with a bunch of blue shirts, a bunch of other teams, and actually spend a day working on your robot in a very intense environment, but get very, very quick support from either your fellow teammates, from blue shirts, from sort of anyone else. It's also a, potentially a chance to see what is sometimes quite a cool venue. Um, along with that, we have some challenges, which are intentionally doesn't tell you anything about what they are, because I will get onto them later. As well, there is a virtual competition. Again, doesn't tell you anything about it. We'll get onto it later. And then competition in on a weekend in April. Where's the button? There it is. So, like I say, we're planning on running these tech days on these dates. Um, the slides will be available after the fact. You don't need to scurry for cameras. Um, and as well, there's obviously the live stream. Um, so yes, we're still working on finalizing locations, but we are hoping to get them out very soon. They will all be on a Saturday. They will all be somewhere in the UK. And we're hoping to run potentially multiple on these days. So we can sort of, um, like I say, there are teams in lots of places and we want to try and get tech days to them. So, starting from today, you have about five months to design your robot. You need to build a prototype. You need to build an actual robot. You'll need to do quite a lot of electronics better than this. Can't stress that enough. You'll need to write quite a lot of code. You'll need to test your robot. You will need to test your robot. You need to test it some more and test it even more. I can't stress enough how important testing is. You'll need to work as a, work as a team, an actual team, not just one person doing everything. You'll need to get your robot inspected by someone who is more qualified than my cat. Scuzzy is more qualified than my cat, right? Good enough. You will then, after all of that, you will compete. You'll compete a little bit more, and you'll compete even more. You'll compete in lots and lots of matches. This isn't just a you turn up, you do one match, you go home. You'll run quite a few different matches throughout the weekend. You will have the chance to meet other robots. You have the chance to meet other people. And you will hopefully be able to score some points, win some prizes, and have fun, we hope. So, like I said, throughout this and some of the pictures, we've sort of gone through and you've seen various different robots, but robots tend to come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Some look like cardboard boxes. Some look very complicated and versatile. Some look quite a lot like cars. Others look like car washes. Some look like spiders. Um, and really sort of anything else. Your imagination really is the limit and sort of the tools that are available to you. Um, yeah, these are all, all of these images are from student robotics robots. All of these are from last year's robots. Some of them might, 
Some of the people who built them might be in this room. I don't know. Probably. So, some design tips. Um, above all else, read the rules. You'll get the rules. Um, I'm going to go through the game and some of the rules later on today. But um, once they're on our website, which they should be later on today, um, please give them a read. Everything that you need to know should be in there about size constraints um, and various other things. Um, you also need to think, OK, how is my robot going to move? Am I going to use wheels, tracks, legs, whatever? Um, that is entirely up to you. Um, you'll need to think about exposed mechanisms, partly because you're not going to want a piece of another robot jamming into yours and causing issues. And as well, sort of from a safety perspective, what we don't want is one of our um, marshals to go and pick the robot up and have it lose a finger. We don't really want that, and that makes our health and safety person sad. Um, as well, so you have um, one of the things you'll be able to use is um, servos. They're useful for sort of more precise movement, but they're not really good for driving because you give them an angle rather than spin lots of times. Um, you'll need to work out how your robot is actually going to fit together. You can't sort of hold two pieces of wood like that and hope that they stay there. That, that isn't how it works. You'll need to think of how is it going to work. Is it going to be nails, L brackets, screws, 3D printed brackets, whatever. Um, that's going to depend on what tools and ideas are available to you. Um, as well, you're going to need to think about how big your robot's going to be. Um, the rules do specify a size constraint, but that is an upper limit. There is no lower limit. Um, apart from what you can physically fit on the robot. Um, so you'll need to think what shape's it going to be and everything like that. As well, you'll need to think what tools are available to you. You've seen lots of different robots, but it's going to depend on the tools you have available to you, whether that's personally or in your school's DT department. That could be quite a constraint. There's no point assuming, oh, we're going to laser cut all of our wooden parts if you don't have a laser cutter. That isn't going to work. Um, as well, sort of sensors. Your robots are completely autonomous. You press start, and that is it. So you'll need to work out how is your robot going to sense the environment that it's put in. Um, there are sort of lots of sensors that are available to you. You can realistically use anything you want. Um, but for example, you might use our vision system to detect some of the markers you can kind of see um, dotted around the arena. You might use bump sensors to check if you've hit into something, which happens quite a lot and it's quite entertaining, but you might want to do something when it happens. You might use a light gate so you can check if something's crossed between the arms of your robot. You might use a potentiometer to work out if you've actually hit something or just brushed it. You could use rotary encoders to check that the wheels, how many times the wheels are spinning, accelerometers to try and help work out where you're going, gyroscopes for similar reasons. Um, they all have their merits. Um, they're good in some cases, they're bad in others, and it's sort of it's your job to work out um, when you might want to use them. Um, and they're not they're not all good at everything. You can't use everything for every reason. So, along with sensors, you're going to have to do some form of electronics. You'll need to work out sort of okay on your robot where are they going to go, um, how long are the wires going to be to make sure you can actually get the wires from the sensor back to the other parts of your robot. Um, how will you get power over there and data over there, whether it be USB, wire, anything like that? Um, you'll need to make sure that your um, start and stop button are easily accessible, because you need to be able to start and stop it easily, and as well as a safety point. Um, you'll need two USB ports to be easily accessible, one for your code and one for a USB drive, which will provide the competition to tell you what corner you're in. Um, and of course, you'll need to make sure that your battery is protected. That one's very important, and I will underline that in a second. So, some recommended steps. Um, some of us have been doing student robotics for quite a while. Some of us a little longer than others. Some of us are a bit older than others. Um, but yes, we've been doing this quite a while, and we've come up with some recommendations. One of the big ones, make a test base as soon as possible. Um, you want to think about how, what the mechanics are. How's that going to work? Um, what sensors are you going to use? What strategy are you going to use? Are you know, more for an offensive strategy, more of a defensive strategy, a random strategy to confuse your opponents and the commentating team? Whatever, that's up to you. Um, you'll need to work on sort of um, improving your design iteratively. You're going to want to make sure that you are always improving and always um, 
sort of moving forwards and trying not to break things constantly. Um, small improvements and make sure it keeps working. And as I've said many, many times, and I will keep saying, testing, lots and lots of testing. There's no point building something if you can't prove that it's actually working. And yes, testing, very, very critical. You need to know how it actually performs. Um, we do tend to see quite a lot that teams who have tested their robot more, especially when it comes to the final competition in the final competition environment, tend to do better. Um, you're going to want to get, like I say, something moving quicker so you actually have something to be testing against and working on rather than just working entirely theoretical because theory, unfortunately, isn't everything. Now, the kit. So as well as um, all of the strategy things, we are giving you a quite fancy high-tech kit to be able to um, talk to various different um, components that should hopefully help you in building your robot as much as possible because we're not going to just send you out empty-handed and tell you to get on. Um, this will be handed out to you after the presentations. You will have seen some white boxes as you came in. That's got the kit in. Um, if you're remote, we'll be in touch. So the brain board, as we call it, um, this is the brains of the operation, as it says. Um, this is, it looks quite a lot like a Raspberry Pi 4 because it's a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, this is where sort of your code runs. This is um, what will then talk to all the other parts of our kit to tell it what to do. Um, it runs completely custom um, software that we've written in-house. It's where your code executes, and there is a little tiny thing on the top. Uh, this is what we call the KCH. This is a custom um, Raspberry Pi hat, uh, a term that some might be familiar with. Um, this is what actually powers the Pi. So rather than using the Type-C port, you plug 12 volts straight in there, and it does the rest. Um, it's got LEDs, which will nicely show you um, the boot progress and to make sure everything's working properly. You can see um, like whether your code is working, whether the Wi-Fi is running, whether it's waiting to have the start button pressed. Um, and as well, sort of because it's 2022 and everything needs RGB, apparently, there are also three RGB LEDs that you can do whatever you like with. Now, as well, your robot is obviously going to need to move around. So for that, we have the motor board. It controls motors because we're good at naming things. Uh, each single motor board can drive up to two motors. We give you two boards, which means you have the ability to control four motors. Um, we don't provide the motors in the kit, um, but there is information on the docks for exactly what kind of motors these boards can drive. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to use that to source them, or potentially if you've got motors from either previous competitions or previous years or things like that, you should be able to use them. Um, another aptly named board, the servo board. It controls servos. In this case, one servo board will actually control 12 different servos. Um, and these can be used for much more finer movement, like the, the spider that we saw earlier. Um, that was using servos to actually move its, its individual um, sort of uh, joint of its legs were all individual servos. Um, you will need to be careful if you put too much strain on a servo, they can draw quite a lot of power and can also damage the servo internally. So you don't want to put too much strain on a servo, but for things like arms, they can be very useful. I and mean, again, we don't include the servos, but also there's information on the docks for how, for what kind of servos you might need. Now, another aptly named board, um, the power board. This is the one which deals with distributing power to the rest of the kit, because last time I checked, electronics do need power. Um, the power board does provide three different, quote, types of power, something any electronics student hearing me say will kill me for. Um, but it will provide sort of a high current 12 volt output. There are low current 12 volt outputs and there are five volt outputs. Um, and these can be configured and controlled and plugged into sort of um, whatever you need to. Um, as well, the power board is where your start and on button are. So we have the power button here in the red, which actually turns the robot on and off. And then once your robot, once your code is actually sort of started up as it were, it will wait for you to press the start button, which is the black one. Um, and as well, we do also, like it says here, there is a small piezoelectric buzzer. Um, 
We've had lots of teams play various different music through it for fun. We've had teams use it for debugging. We've had teams use it to annoy the blue shirts. We've had them do lots and lots of things. Um, the one thing I will say is the actual competition will be much louder than these buzzers will work. Our speakers are a lot bigger. So you probably won't be able to hear it in a competition match, but it's still quite cool anyway. Um, and this is the only board that will be connected to the batteries that we provide. No other, all power on the kit will come through this. So as well, one of the other things is sort of on, if you've ever used a Raspberry Pi before, you'll know the phrase GPIO, which stands for general purpose input output. Um, we, the hat cuts off those pins. And so we're providing a Ruggedino. Um, this has some extra um, custom firmware. We call it a Ruggedino, but it's an Arduino. If you've ever used an Arduino, it's basically the same, but quote, harder to blow up. Not a challenge. Um, yes, it's happened before at a kickstart. Not blow up, but damage. Um, so yes, these boards also support, um, they'll do analog, digital, and PWM as well, should you need two things. Um, there's sort of many uses for these. Lots of the sensors I mentioned earlier will probably interface with this board. Um, we provide firmware on it to do a lot of the basics. So you can interface with it from the rest of the API. But you can also, if you would like to, you can go in, program it yourself, add custom commands, custom firmware, custom everything. And there are docs on the docs for how to actually do that. So batteries, and yes, the screen went orange because it's very important. They should be treated with respect. Batteries, particularly ones that are that size, they're quite dangerous. Um, these lithium polymer batteries, you want to treat them with respect. Um, you're going to want to follow the charging procedure on the docks to the letter every single time. Um, as part of the micro games that we will get onto later, there is a part for how to charge a battery safety, safely. Um, and we will get onto that. And it should only ever be connected to two things. One being the power board that we supply and another being a battery charger that we supply. It shouldn't be plugged into anything else. If you've got other things that look like they have the same connector, no, don't use it. Similarly, only use the battery chargers that we provide. If your battery charger goes wrong, tell us, we'll ship you a new one. Um, and as well, sort of the general things for batteries, there's a line here that says protect them from mechanical damage. I normally phrase this as don't stab it. Um, basically, because the batteries are quite sensitive, they are fine, but you still want to make sure that another robot driving at you at slightly the wrong angle isn't going to um, either damage the wires or the battery itself. Um, if you're unsure on anything with batteries, battery safety, or safety in general, um, come and talk to us. We've got your supervisors will have our email or you can talk to us in Discord or they can talk to us in Discord. We're fairly easily accessible. So vision. Um, this is one of the sensors that we do actually provide you out the box. So on uh, one of the things we will provide you is a webcam. That webcam is capable of picking up things that look very similar to this. Um, you might think it's a QR code. It's not a QR code. Um, the idea behind this is that um, the arena is covered in markers that look very similar to this. Um, and what that means is if your robot is looking at one of these, you will be able to work out full positioning as to where that marker is. So you'll be able to work out um, what number it is, because um, around the arena, they're all individually uh, numbered. You'll be able to work out how far away it is, what angle you're looking at it at, what angle it's looking at you at. Um, what orientation is it? Is it upside down? Is it leaning backwards, forwards? Everything like that is all accessible through our vision system. Um, and this is quite a powerful sense that we do seem to see a lot of teams using because it does give you quite a lot of information that can be quite handy. So your code. Um, as a software engineer, this is the bit I quite like. Um, this is how you will actually be controlling your robot because like I say, it is Student Robotics is a autonomous competition. The start button is pressed at the start of a match. That's it, no radio control, no giving it commands, nothing, just start, go. So you need to actually tell it what to do. Um, so your code will be written in Python, specifically Python 3.10. Um, Python's a pretty language and it's also on most of your curriculums. So that's quite helpful. 
um, we will give you a module to actually help with controlling our boards. So you can basically say something as simple as turn motor zero on motor board one on at half speed. And that's one line and it just deals with the actual talking to the hardware and everything else. Um, it is because this is code, it is, um, you'll be developing it locally. So you'll want to make sure that it is backed up. Um, the backups are your responsibility. If you turn up to the competition and have left the USB drive at your school, either you can drive back and get it very, very quickly, or that's a problem. Um, so make sure sort of lots of people are have access to it, make sure that it's um, backed up. And because chances are you will be distributed, it is generally better not to just be working on it in school, working on it at home can be quite helpful. Um, so you'll need to work out sort of how you want to handle that. Um, if you'd like some help on sort of some good strategies and ideas for how to do the sort of collaborative programming, um, come and talk to some of us blue shirts because we basically do it for a living. Um, and sort of what will happen is you'll write your code it will be in a file called robot.py, and that will have your code in. If you want to split it up in other files, that's fine too, but the entry point is robot.py. You'll then put that code onto your USB stick, put it in the robot, it'll boot up, start running the code, and then you press start and off it goes. Now, well, something that if anyone's competed in student robotics before, they will have seen the very shonky tablet interface that we shipped about two or three years ago. Um, the, we've now completely redone it from scratch and got rid of the shonky tablets. So there is now just a Wi-Fi web interface. Um, and what this will be able to do is give you sort of some live logs as to what your robot is doing at that moment in time. Um, the logs are also available in a file that's put on the USB stick, but quite often it's useful for debugging to actually see what it's doing as it's doing it. You can't give it commands necessarily, but it's still nice to see what it's doing, what it's thinking about, particularly if you're like testing vision stuff. Um, and as well, sort of from the UI, you also have, up here, you have a start and stop button if you're too lazy to go over to the robot and hit the button. You'd be surprised, that's quite a convenient thing. Walking is annoying. So there is, with the kit, there is way too much to even start covering um, in this presentation. And so the docs are all online. Everything I have said is in them, plus a lot more. Um, so I definitely make sure to give them a read. That will tell you how to do, how the programming API works, how the boards work, um, how the electronics -y bits work that I'm not remotely qualified to talk about, um, and everything else. A lot of things are, Chances are an answer you'll get from us is, it's in the docs, here it is. And so I definitely make sure, give it a read. Um, Strobe.org slash docs, we'll get you there. Um, as well, some of you will have already um, seen this, but your team leaders will have had an email to join our Discord server. Um, and what this allows you to do is in a much more real-time capacity than email is even remotely able to give you is being able to talk both with us, with the supervisors and with other teams about what's going on. Um, you'll be able to get um, support from all of us. You'll be able to share tricks and everything and just generally brag about your team, something that HRS are very good at from our experience. Um, and yes, um, if you're already in the Discord, fantastic. If you're not in there yet, um, your team supervisors will have the login details. But if you're having any problems, let us know by email because you won't have access to the Discord to let us know. Um, but yes, and we'll be, um, we'll be able to help get you onboarded. Um, we're going to be in there both throughout all of today and hopefully throughout the entire competition. So we should be able to give you some fairly quick response times on lots of things. Now, health and safety. Um, robots must be safe. Um, there will be a safety inspection before the competition, before there are any physical events. Um, not done by my cat, done by SCSI. Um, and so you'll need to make sure that SCSI is happy, basically. Um, and so sort of, there are lots of different facets for how that safety check is done, but some of the, sort of, um, some of the key ones is that um, you'll need to think, how easy is it for the robot to turn off? What we don't want to do is if something's happening, for example, the battery has been dislodged and is hanging out the back, has happened, how easy is it to turn off? We need, if we need to go and literally chase it around the arena, we don't want to be trying to fumble at it to find the start button. It needs to be obvious and needs to be easy to press. Similarly, if we pick it up, if it's running across the arena, is it going to hurt us? Is it gonna hurt 
us or you or um, anyone else, other robots or things like that. It needs to be harmless. Um, is the wiring messy or loose? The picture I showed you earlier of doing all the electronics, that would not pass at all. Um, it doesn't need to be proper like computer cable management level wire everything down, but just everything needs to be clear and um, make sense. Um, you'll want to make sure color coding your wiring is a very easy way of doing this. Um, having black always be the ground and have no other wires be black makes life a lot easier when you're hunting for the ground. Um, is the kit loose? Similarly, when it's driving across the floor, is a battery going to fall at the back? Are the other, mot are the other boards going to fall at the back? Or if it rattles around, are they going to come loose and wires disconnect? Generally, we don't want that. Um, bumps and scrapes and everything else in the arena are basically inevitable. And what you don't want is one bump in slightly the wrong way to unplug something very important, particularly in the final, and your robot lose because of it. Um, and of course, is the battery protected? And I will underline this yet again. The battery should be protected um, from mechanical damage, from stabbing, from sort of um, from anything else. And as well, sort of, is the power button accessible? Because if we're trying to chase it around the arena, which happens and is entertaining, we don't want to be chasing it for too long. Now, support. Um, you are not alone. Um, there are. It is okay to ask for help if something is confusing. That's Fairly normal. This is this is a complicated challenge. It's okay for things to look daunting. Um, there are sort of lots of different ways you'll be able to get help. Um, one of them is from us volunteers. Quite a few of us have previously competed in screen robotics before. We've sat exactly where you are, only some of us even just a few years ago, um, finding out about how the competition works. Um, we're going to be watching Discord and everything. Um, to make sure that sort of we are easily um, contactable and to make sure we can provide the best help that we can. Um, and team leaders know how to get in touch with us if they can't, if you can't for whatever reason. Um, as well, like I mentioned, tech days are a great way to get help because if you need help from us and we're not being communicative, if we're literally in the same room as you, you can come up and talk to us. Generally, that is a lot easier. Um, as well, Discord. It's a fantastic opportunity to be able to actually talk to us very quickly, get proper communications going, share images, videos. You could even um, get voice channels to actually talk with us much even better than just text, um, text things. There's information on how to get that on our docs as well. Um, and as well, your team supervisors. Um, some of them have been doing this for quite a few years, even longer than I have in some cases. Um, they also know some things about how the kit works, how the program works, some strategy ideas, some strategy pitfalls and things like that. So as well, talk to them. They may be able to help you as well. Um, and of course, um, sharing knowledge. You're going to want to make sure that not one person is doing absolutely everything on your robot, because if that one person is, say, on holiday, your robot can't grind into a halt. You're going to need to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. Um, the term bus factor is another way of phrasing this kind of making sure that not one person knows everything, generally because if one person gets hit by a bus, that's a problem. Um, there's nicer ways of saying don't get hit by a bus, though. As well, keep it simple. Um, quite often, the, the robots that do the best in our competition are ones that don't try and do everything. They just try and do one thing very, very well, very, very reliably, and then iterate from there. You don't want to try and do everything and fall short. You want to try and do the simple things and slowly build from there. And of course, prototype. You're going to want to get something moving. You're going to want to get it early. And you're going to want to be testing very, very often. Now, the game. I've talked a lot about how the robots are built, how they're going to work. Um, but with this, I'm now going to talk about what you're actually going to do and what the robot needs to do. And in this, this is the game, which hopefully is the moment you've all been waiting for. Hopefully. So the game for Student Robotics 2023 is called Greed, which is a name which tells you absolutely nothing about the game. So Greed is played in an arena which looks exactly like this. Um, the, it's a four robot game. So you've got robots in all of the four corners. Um, 
with a nice big raised platform in the middle, which is the nice um, black area, or we're calling it the plinth. Um, each match is 150 seconds, which is two and a half minutes. Um, and in that time, you will start on sort of along one edge. Um, and you can start pointing in any direction you want. Um, what you will need to do is you'll need, you will start in, in sort of each, the arena is split into quadrants, and in your quadrant are some tokens. The idea is to get more. Um, and all of the tokens start in someone's scoring zone, and the idea is you will need to steal them from the other teams whilst they're trying to steal yours, hence greed. Um, the tokens, they are cardboard boxes, and you will have seen there are three different types, There's silver, bronze, and gold. Now, in the middle, there is a raised plinth. This is not movable, and that is not a challenge. Um, it's seven and a half centimeters high, and there are gold tokens lodged in sort of some of the corners. They will be touching the walls. Now, the tokens themselves are worth different numbers of points to you. Um, if you have a bronze token in your quadrant, then you get three points. If you have a silver token in your quadrant, you get seven points. And if you have a gold token in your quadrant, you get 21. Um, and obviously this adds up. If you have two bronze tokens, that's six points because three times two is six. Um, now as for identifying these. Um, historically, we would have said, ah, yes, all of the tokens have in different um, vision markers on, so you can tell which is which. No, we're not doing that. All of them have the same marker on. If you look at any of them, they all have the same, they will all tell you they are the same marker. They say, ah, I'm number 72, or whatever number we actually end up picking. Um, so you'll need to actually find some other ways of distinguishing um, which ones. And one of the things I will say is, whilst the gold token is obviously bigger, silver and bronze are the same size, but they're not the same weight. Silver tokens are heavier than bronze tokens. And this gives you sort of another avenue for distinguishing which token is which, so you can make sure maybe you want to optimize for going for just the ones that get you the most. Maybe you don't want to do that and you just want to go for absolutely everything. That's also fine too. Um, the tokens will, st this looks random, but they will start in these locations, and the locations are written in the rules, down to the millimeter with some tolerance. Um, tokens inside a robot are worth one third of their actual weighting. So rather than a bronze token being worth three, it's only worth one. Um, and in case it wasn't obvious, um, if you are, say, this robot down here, this is your scoring zone. You start inside your scoring zone. Now, the competition itself is split into four different sections. Um, three and four are fairly normal for anyone who's competed before. You will come to April, come to April, come to a venue in April, um, and you'll compete in a league. These, the points you score in the league will be used to seed a knockout bracket, and then you will play in said knockout bracket until we have the winners. But as well, we're sort of doing something a little bit different, namely challenges and the virtual league. My clicker stopped working. There we go. So the virtual competition, um, like I've sort of said in passing, there is a simulator. Um, this is a full 3D simulator based on a, a platform called WeBots. Um, if any of you team leaders competed in the virtual competition, the same simulator. Um, there are, um, this match will be played in our virtual simulator, which looks exactly like um, the actual arena. It is to scale. Um, you don't, we've already built you robots, um, but besides that, the strategy and whatever you want to use is entirely up to you. Um, there are, you'll be playing four matches. These will be played a week before the competition in April, so around um, the middle of March, I think that makes it. Um, we'll be introduced to the simulator later on today as part of the micro game, so get that installed, set up, running, ready to go. And like I say, this will be one month before the physical competition. 
um, you are playing for actual league points. This isn't just a, it's a cool thing to do. You get actual points for this, which can actually make a difference in the final competition. The other thing we have are challenges. These are also um, new this year. And whilst the virtual competition is one month before, the challenge deadlines are actually even sooner than that. Um, the idea again is you are playing for actual league points that will make an actual difference in the final competition and could be the difference between coming in first, second, third, tenth, could be anything. Um, and the idea is sort of to try and make sure that you don't just build your robot the weekend before the competition. That happens quite a lot. So there are sort of three different challenges um, that will be played throughout the year. Um, there's a movement-based challenge, there's a sensor-based challenge, and there's a vision-based challenge. Um, you can complete these challenges in any order you like, um, and the actual specifics for what the challenges are are noted down in the rulebook, along with any sort of specifics that might be there based on the challenge itself. Um, now, the deadlines for these are January the 7th and February the 4th. The deadline for them is 8 p.m. UK time on those dates. Um, the idea is you'll need to take a video of your robot doing the thing and submit it onto Discord. Um, if you complete one challenge by the 7th, that gives you eight league points. And if you complete a different challenge by the, 14th, by the 4th of February, you'll get an additional eight league points. Um, you can't do the same one multiple times with we're already smart enough to that. So, prizes. This is a competition after all, and um, you probably would like to win something. Um, the exact definitions for all of the prizes and what you need to do for them are written in our rulebook. Um, but sort of to run through the basics, there is obviously first place, second place, third place, the fairly obvious ones. And then because it's Extreme Robotics, we like to mix things up a bit. There is a rookie award. Um, so for teams who haven't competed in student robotics before, out of interest, how many of you haven't competed in this before? Raise hands. OK, that's a reasonable number. Um, so this award is specifically for you. So as I mentioned, the competition, the physical one, is split into two parts. There's a league and then the knockouts. For the rookie, i.e. the team who hasn't competed in student robotics before that places highest in the league, you win, you win the Rookie Award. Similarly, um, Robot and Team Image. Um, some teams like to turn up in, to the competition in fancy dress, generally trying to build a theme with their fellow competitors and their robot and everything else. And we see, we see teams put in a lot of effort on this, presumably because they want to win the Robot and Team Image Award. Um, this is awarded at the final competition based on the team that turns up in the best fancy dress, has the best theme, has puts the most effort into their uh, robot and team image. And we kind of want to reward this. Similarly as well, there is the online presence award. Um, so we encourage teams to be active on the internet, whether that's on social media, whether that's blogging, uh, Discord as well also counts towards this. Um, and so we want to make sure that the teams that are doing sort of the best engagement, whether that's saying what they're doing, whether that's talking to other teams and just generally being social, online presence is the award that we give to reward that. Throughout the year, if you are using social media, uh, be sure to use hashtag Strobo2023. That means that our um, marketing team will be able to actually see what you're doing and make sure that it's, um, it's being rewarded. We are on most of the major platforms. So we should be able to find it. If you're, con if you're concerned you're using some obscure platform and aren't sure if it counts, let us know and we'll be able to keep track of it. Um, but yes, like I say, talking in Discord and being social does help. Um, the committee award. Um, this is the award that we give for not necessarily the robot that did the best, but the robot that had sort of the best ingenuity and excellence in robot design, as it says. Um, this is for sort of the best engineering, the best sort of most interesting idea or mechanism or various things like that. And sort of an elegant execution in an idea doesn't necessarily mean it has to do fantastically, but if it's a really good idea, we want to reward the sort of engineering mindset. 
and the committee award is what we will use to do that. Um, yeah. As well, the, the challenges, like I mentioned earlier, there are, there are two deadlines for the challenges, but there are three challenges. And so the team that competes all of the challenges first wins the challenges award. Um, and that is all three challenges, not just the two by the deadline. And it is the first team, so time is of the essence on this one. Now, the rules, which that's last year's rules. The rules that don't look like that, but look very similar to that, um, make sure to read them. Um, it's very important that you understand them. You don't want to build a robot that is either out of spec or trying to, I don't know, play a different game. Um, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you read them, understand them, and of course, if you have any questions, you can ask them A, in a second, B, throughout the day, and C, throughout the year. Um, exact measurements for everything I have mentioned is on in the rule book, and so hopefully from there, you'll be able to get the specific numbers for where is this token, how spread out are the markers on the arena wall, and things like that. Um, you can ask questions basically anywhere, and hopefully we'll be able to help and I'll answer your burning questions soon. Now, the micro games. So now you know sort of what you need to do, you now need to learn how you're going to do it. And the way we do this is what we call the micro games. And it's a way of getting familiar with your kit through a series of challenges. And the challenges sort of form, they are different challenges to the, what we're calling the challenges as part of the competition, but they're still challenges. Um, as this is split into two parts, there is a kit part, which sadly you'll only be able to do if you have a kit, which really only applies to the people who are in this room. Um, and then there is the simulator part, and that is a way to get familiar with how the simulator works. And that the simulator is on our website, ready to go right now, so you can download that if you're remote and start having a play. Um, yes, all of these, these can be found sort of um, on the docs, and we'll have um, links to that as well once we get into the computer room to do the micro games. Um, once you've got, um, once you've got answers, we, we have what the correct answers are for the challenges and we'll be able to, um, confirm they're correct, help you if they're not, and then you can move on to the next challenge and stuff like that. If you're having any issues, if you're in person, wave hands frantically to get our attention. And if you're remote, um, Discord is probably the best way to do that. Now, plan for the rest of today. Currently, you are in the Kickstart presentation. Um, Afterwards, we will move into kit handout. Um, if you've already signed a disclaimer form and it's with us, you'll be able to get your kit and get started with the micro games. If not, we have forms downstairs that can be, um, the disclaimer can be signed and then we can give you the kits. After that, at sort of 12, uh, 12.30, we will head um, into lunch, um, which is, I definitely recommend having a break. Today is gonna be lots of information flooding your brains. And so it's good to have a bit of a break. But during that break, you can still chat about your robot, come up with strategies, talk to us about strategies, ask us questions, everything else. We're still here. And then after lunch, back onto the micro games until about five or when you finish um, the micro games, whichever happens first. So with that, any questions? Yes. If you need to leave early, you can absolutely leave early. That is fine. Yes? Will the robots have markers on them? Or is that... The robots will not have markers on them, no. Yes? So how much do boxes weigh? Uh, um, a number that's written in the rules. Um, they're not like, them. so they're still cardboard boxes. So they're not like 10 kilograms or anything insane. <coughs> they're still cover boxes that you should be able to lift up fairly easily. Um, I want to say they're about like 100 grams and 300 grams, something around those ballparks. Um, but the actual, the specific numbers are written in the rules. Any other questions? Yes. They're worth the same number of points. So all tokens, all, to, all bronze tokens are worth the same number. Um, but obviously you start with, was it five or six? So if you gain an extra two, fantastic, that's 
seven or eight, but if someone else steals some of yours, obviously that number goes down. So there's opportunity for it to come up and down. There isn't, theoretically, if you move none of them, you still get the number of points for how many are in there, even if you don't actually move any. So you potentially can end up doing nothing and still get quite a lot of points. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. You were there. With, okay, so the question to repeat it for the live stream is if a token is inside your robot, does that count as yours or does that count as the, the zone that the, the robot is in? So I believe the rules say that if you lift the robot and uh, the tokens come with it, then it is in the robot. Yeah, so if you, yeah, so what we'll do is at the end of a match, we'll come over, lift the robot. If the tokens move with the robot, they count as in the robot and tokens in the robot count as yours? Yes, James is nodding, that means yes. So in answers, yes. It is clarified in the rules. This is in the rules, I just can't quite remember them. Any other questions? There is no such thing as a stupid question. If you're thinking it and you're not quite sure, ask it, because chances are someone else is thinking it as well. No, in, so you cannot use the, the web interface does have a restart button. In the competition, the web interface is completely disabled. There is no ability to see the live logs in an actual competition match. So no, you cannot restart your robot during a competition. I forget what the rules are around if you want us to restart it. I believe the ruling is we won't do it um, because we're stubborn like that. Um, but that will all be clarified when we get to the competition. Yes. If the box is inside your robot to a zone and you pick up the robot and the box goes out of the robot, does that count as not inside your robot? So, you so you're know. saying if you if we pick up the robot and the token falls out, yeah. what happens? So in that case it would count as in the zone, not in the robot, which would mean it would be worth the full points rather than the third of the points. So it's specifically when we lift it up, if the tokens come with it, then they're in the robot. If they're not, they're in the scoring zone. Um, yes. Yes. So similarly then, if a token's on the floor and a token's on top of that token, that still counts as being in the zone? Ooh. Um, I can't remember the exact wording. Um, that should be specified in the rules. If it's not, once I have the rule book in front of me, which will probably be in, you know, about half an hour's time, <laughs> ask me then and we can work it out. And we will, if it's not obvious, we might be able to improve the wording of it slightly to make it more obvious. Uh, yes? Um, the doc specified different point values than you said. Which one's correct? Also? Different, the do they? Different point values for than you said. What do the rules specify? So the rules say that bronze is three, silver is 12, but gold is 30. Trust the rules. Don't trust me, but also sometimes trust me. Uh, yes. Yes. So if I if I can jump back far enough to where uh, let's come back to let's actually get an image of the arena up because it's going to be easier. Uh, that'll do. Yeah. So there are twenty eight along all the walls, so seven on each wall. Um, they are, the spacing of them is in the rules. The, num e the number that each one is, is also in the rules. They do count up. We're not just putting them in randomly. Um, and they should be fairly accurate because you need the locations of those quite accurately. Uh, yes, right at the back. Are there markers on the um, central No. Um, there are, the markers are on the, they're on two places. They're on all of the tokens and they're on the arena walls. They're not on anything else. Um, and as well, just to clarify, the, the token, the markers are all the same. The markers on the tokens are all the same size. And so that means that on the, on the bronze tokens, they're gonna be quite flush to the edges. And on the gold tokens, they're still the same size, but because the token's bigger, there's more padding around the edges. Um, that means that distance calculations and stuff like that will still be correct, even though because the marker is the same size. 
Yes. Are gold tokens by default in your scoring zone? Yes. One is in your scoring zone because it's, if we take this bottom one, that is in your scoring zone. Um, the other three obviously aren't in your scoring zone, they're in someone else's. So a strategy might be to go and get them. The, so very good question to clarify, yes. The, the hard black line is a wall. The dotted line is just there for effect. Okay. That, that might be tape, but generally it will be something you don't need to worry about driving over. Um, but it is the black line, and as well, the, the black square is, the whole thing's the same height, but that's also part of the plinth. Okay. Uh, yes. Is the square in the middle in your scoring zone? Yes, yes. So if you imagine that these dotted lines extended into the plinth, that part would count. Um, you could, I guess, theoretically put tokens in on the plinth if you wanted to make them harder to get. Um, but obviously if you push them a little too far, then you may end up giving points to another team. Um, because the basis is if a token is in a scoring zone, it's in the scoring zone. If a token is straddling the line, it's in both. So you will need to be careful to make sure you don't push it too far. And it's even a little bit on the line, because on the line is counted as both. Just yes, on the line, yes, so we, so this, this dotted line is a piece of tape, and if it's on the tape, it's in both. So if, if it's touching the line, you're giving points to both? Yes, right. yes. So, so token, so sorry, so yes, tokens that are in your robot are worth a third of tokens that are on the floor. It's not possible to, for them to be on the floor and in your robot because of the lifting rule. Um, there's no like, you don't get extra points if it's like in your, in your robot, but also in your scoring in like, and your robot is within your area, that's still just worth a third. Yes. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I want to say they're about the same. The gold, so bronze and silver are the same size. Silvers are heavier. Silvers and gold should be about the same weight. Any other hands, any other questions? I promise you there is no such thing as a stupid question and this is the best time to ask a question. Do the challenges count towards league points? Challenges do count towards league points, yes. The challenge completion is worth eight league points and the second one is also worth an additional eight. So you potentially have 16 league points from the challenges and also the matches in the virtual competition also count towards those league points. Um, and so that means potentially you can come to the competition in April with quite a few league points ready to go into the actual league matches that are there. Yes. How high are the walls? How high are the walls? They are the, which walls? Do you mean the plinth walls or the arena walls? Um, the uh, ones coming off. These ones. They are seven and a half centimeters um, with a tolerance, both of which are written in the rules. Yes. Fantastic question. So in the rules, we specify that a robot has to fit within 50 centimeters cubed at the start of a match. So before you press the start button, it has to be within those constraints. After the start button, it can extend to a maximum of uh, 75 centimeters on one of the axes and then 75 centimeters high. Um, it's not on all of the axes because it's also not unbounded. Um, we did have, I've gone a tangent a little bit, in a previous competition we had a game similar to this but tokens started in the middle and there was no central point. We had a team, I want to say it was SR 2018, that a way of collecting them was to start in their corner, basically hold what is a piece of cling film out the back, drive straight up, straight along, straight down and back and then tighten the cling film surprisingly not very effective 
Um, so yes, there is, so that's why we now have the greatest extent rule is to make sure that you can't do that. Um, similarly, you can't like drop equipment to like block other teams. That's also not okay. And that is also in the rules. Yes. Say that again, sorry? The tokens. Oh, the micro games, no. The micro games are just a training exercise. That doesn't count as anything. The first time points start mattering is the first challenge, which was the 7th of January. Before then, it's just training. And as well, sort of, while you're doing development in schools, that obviously doesn't count either. It's the challenges, the virtual competition, and then the final event. Yes? Uh, what kind of floor is that? The floor is short pile carpet, very similar to what you're stood on. That's why I bent down to check the carpet. Um, yes, it will be, should be, yeah, it'll all be um, carpet. It'll be carpet, probably carpet roll, not carpet tile. Um, but yes, it will be a carpeted surface. Uh, yes. Is this the bump from last competition? So that was a feature of the room that we were in. Um, if the rules don't specify that the floor is flat, maybe don't assume the floor is flat. Um, the floor should be fairly flat. And we do, now that we have learned this, we do intend to try better to make it flatter. But sadly, sort of sometimes things happen. Uh, yes. We don't yet know. We are very, we were very close to being able to announce it, but sadly it just slipped. We're hoping to get it very, very, very soon. I can tell you it'll be a weekend very early in April, but sadly I can't give them any more um, confirmation than that. Yeah, we're hoping to get it as soon as we physically can. Uh, we do try and avoid things like Easter holidays, for, also when yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do. We yeah, it's it's a difficult balance. We do try and get it out as early as possible, and we are actively working on getting that date confirmed. So we're hoping to get it out very very soon. Uh, yes, yes. Um. You, I believe the rules specify you can't drop supporting equipment. Um, there is a literal asterisk on that rule in that if you would like to apply for an exemption to it, you can. You just need to give us details of how you're going to make sure that it's like not going to become a hindrance to other people, how you're going to make sure that it still fits within the general sporting conduct of the game and things like that. So there's, with those rules specifically, there is some sort of flexibility. Some of the rules, there's no flexibility, particularly when it comes to safety, but that is one of them where, yes, if you wanted to drop some supporting equipment to hide some tokens or something, you can ask us. I can't say right now whether we would allow it or not. We'd review it on a case-by-case -case basis. And next to you. Dimension tokens. So the gold and silver tokens are 130 millimeters cubed. I believe, with some tolerance, and the gold tokens are about 270 millimeters cubed. The 110 millimeters and 250 millimeters for the tokens, sorry. It is in the rules, that's where James is reading them from. Uh, yes, right back. That's fine. Yes. This is defined. I was wondering why that got put in there. Yes, the volt, voltage limit is now 36. Um, yes, there are, there are a bunch of extra regulations for this kind of thing. There seem to be quite a lot of rules that get put in there for Hills Road. Um, I mean, if it helps, there's a... No, there's a... No, it's older than that. So there's a rule in there that says you're not allowed a device that is 
with the sole purpose of emitting noise. The reason that's in there, I'm afraid, is not Hills Road. That one's on me. <laughs> so when I competed in SR 2014, I strapped speakers to our robot and played music through the competition. Our head judge, Alistair, didn't like that, so put in the rule, and it was only several years later we realized who the other person was. <laughs> Very entertaining conversation, I assure you. Um, yes, any more questions about the game, the rules, the kit, today, student robotics, um, the tokens, the robots, yes. No. So it has to start, your rover has to start inside um, 500 mil cubed. We do have what we call the cube of judgment to make sure that you are within those limits. After you press start, your robot can like expand if it needs to fold out arms or expand a little bit. It can do whatever it wants, so long as it stays in the final constraint, which is measured at any point throughout the competition. It cannot extend further than 75 centimeters high and 75 centimeters along one of the axes. As well, sort of one of the other things, these are, to mention, these are greatest extent. You don't need to build a 50, um, 50 centimeter cube. You can build anything. I mean, there's a robot here, for example, that is a completely fine robot for certain games that is about the caliber that some teams build. Uh, yes. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I believe it's about, James, what are the dimensions of plinth? 600 mil, yes, so that, that inner bit is 600 mil, and I believe these um, extending bits are about a metre. Um, so the other thing to actually mention is... Well. Two metres long, there we go. And the in Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and the entire arena is 575 centimeters square. Um, yes. Yes. Are you allowed to add your own control boards? Yes. So long as they are powered by our battery and our power board, you can add any extra circuits you want. We've had teams add extra servo controllers, add control boards for stepper motors, for extra things. Yes, that's fine. Um, we naturally will check things like, are they still safe? Are they doing insane things? But generally, yes, if you want to add extra control boards for things, that's fine. If you're unsure, absolutely feel free to um, send us a message and we can sort of confirm that, yes, we are definitely okay with this. Um, in Discord, there are, there's a couple of public channels, but the one that starts team dash three letters that you can see is just yours. No other team can see it. We can see it, but no, and everyone in your team can see it, but no other teams can see it. So you can talk sort of um, privately about anything sensitive to your robot in there. What's the maximum amount of damage allowed for token by the end of the game? What is the maximum amount of damage allowed to a token at the end of a game? Fantastic question. Zero. Student Robotics is, as best effort goes, a non-contact sport. If we believe you to be intentionally ramming robots, we reserve the right to audit your code and your strategy to work out what you're trying to do. There is a rule which says you must follow good sporting conduct. And if it's a non-contact sport and you're trying to ram people, that's not considered good sporting conduct and you may be disqualified from the competition or potentially not be allowed to compete in the first place. So yes, don't damage other robots, other tokens, bits of the arena, blue shirts, people, the venue, anything else that you might... Blue shirts are people. Blue shirts are people. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Another question. Yeah, does the robot have to return to 50 centimeters cubed at the end of the match? Does the robot have to return to 50 centimeters cubed at the end of the match? No. 
So at the start of the match, it must be within that size. If it wants to extend at any point, it can extend up to that. Once that start button's pressed, it can extend to any point within that greater extent rule. Um, and then just it means that at the end of the match, you'll be collecting a robot which might be outside the size constraints, but that's okay. So long as you then like fold it back up so at the next match, it's within the size constraints. Yes? No, so this is only your robots. So if you if you were to stack, I don't know, six tokens on top of each other for whatever reason, A, great job. B, that's the the tokens are the things that are outside the extent, not your robot. And so if you had, for example, if you were stacking them inside a carrier bag and that carrier bag extended over the top, that would count as your robot because the carrier bag is part of your robot. But if it's just tokens sticking out the top, that's fine. Um, similarly as well, there is a, um, a thing in the rules about a flag that makes commentators' lives much easier to find out which robot is which because we see quite a few in a given day. Um, the flag itself also doesn't count towards that size limit. Uh, yes? Yes, so fiducial marker is the technical term for the, the vision markers. Um, so it's just making sure that you don't have, that you're not driving around pretending you're a part of the arena, basically. So it can't have on it or cannot produce at any time? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say cannot have on it and good sporting conduct. Yes? Yes, tokens have markers on all six sides. The, num the ID of that marker is the same, both on all faces and on all tokens. So there are 27 markers around the arena edge, and then there is an additional one used on all of the markers. So there are 28 different markers. There'll be 0 to 27, and then a mysterious number 28, or 28th. It might be number 28, it might be number 76. It will be less than 100, but it will be there. And that is documented in the rules. Yes? Is this rule about um, a third of the points if you're in the robot? Yes. Um, and you're, before we're judging that, you're picking the robot up. If we have a judge in stacking, are they in the robots or are they falling off and being counted for where they land? Assume that student robotics volunteers have perfect balance and can lift a robot up without toppling anything. So if there's, if for example, you have a robot that looks like this, so that and there are, in. that would count as in the robot. So if you had six tokens stacked on top of this, we might not necessarily need to lift it because we can see they're obviously on the robot, not on the floor. So it's not, we won't always lift it. It's just the lifting is the sort of um, decider. Um. Yes, um, not necessarily, because you can, if you have a big loop on the back, like a big bag that sort of holds all the tokens, that is fine, um, on the basis that you then, so long as, if they're resting on the floor, that's obviously not okay. Yeah, that's the other thing, once they're home, you're fine. And obviously, because the scoring zones are quite large, that should be fairly simple, hopefully. Uh, yes. Um, if it's dragging them and it's being dragged like, and they're in contact with the floor and it's just dragging them, they'd be on the floor, not in the robot, because if you lift it, they don't come with it. If you're, say, similar to like a forklift and you've got a thing underneath it, that would count as in the robot, because if we were to lift it, the tokens would come with it. Um, like I mentioned with, with the lifting rule, it is a, we use it as a deciding factor. If it's obviously in the robot, will count as in the robot. We won't need to lift it up and risk toppling tokens and things like that. Yes? Uh, how long does the competition go on for? How long does the competition go on for? So the the weekend itself is a weekend. So we will start on... Is it like the, the challenge? Oh, so the one match is 150 seconds, which is two and a half minutes. Um, you'll have multiple matches um, throughout the entire weekend. So we'll have Saturday will be entirely league. Sunday will be part league, part
part knockouts. Um, yeah, and then similarly, the matches are the same length as in the virtual competition as well. So those are the same length. Challenges, it doesn't really matter how long it takes to do the challenge, but please don't submit like a two hour video where you say it's in here somewhere. We'll get you to crop it. We won't wait that long. Yes. If a token is destroyed, is it worth points? Um, theoretically, yes. But if you are the one who destroys it, you'll probably be disqualified. So theoretically, that means it's worth both points and nothing. Theoretically, if you were to destroy a token and leave it in someone else's scoring zone, you would both be disqualified and give them points. And, and I can't stress this enough, annoy the blue shirts. <laughs> and we are the ones commentating, mentoring, and most importantly, judging, would not recommend that as a strategy. Um, I don't like being annoyed. Any final questions? Yes. Um, that would fall under, you can't have fiducial markers on your robot. The markers weren't visible the you can't deploy random equipment into the arena. Um, good sporting conduct is a great one to lean on. Um, there are lots of rules that say you can't do that. I just can't list all of them, but it's more than one. It's quite a lot more than one. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to ask our health and safety person. So I will get to lasers in a second. I do want to ask the question in the room on, can we have a bubble machine on our robot? Um, I've now got to update the risk assessment for liquids on electronics. Um, I would think... Towards no. So this is another thing, is on the one hand, it might be kind of cool, might be kind of funny. If we say, lol, no, go home, not ideal. Um, similarly, with lasers, um, which was another question, assuming you can, assuming, yeah, you have like um, five watt lasers or something reasonably small, you need to make sure there is. Z or, so, I didn't mean, no, sorry, I don't mean five watt, I mean five volt. Five volt lasers, or something small that can be powered by our kit, basically. So that that's the thing is that you, if you were to use it, say for lining up or something, you would need to make with one hundred percent certainty that there was zero risk of it ever pointing anywhere near someone's eyes. And I mean, even if there was the slightest risk, we would say no, and it would not only be a no, it would be a no. Remove the laser. Unplugging, um, theoretically, yes. If that's zero risk to someone's eyes, that's fine. Yeah, generally with health and safety stuff, I go, eh, talk to him. <laughs> Much easier. Oh, is that a hand? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Generally, if it's starting to like burn the arena, we have a problem. Yes. No, it would need to be. So, for if you had, say, um, Zip ties are a much easier analogy than what I was thinking. But yes, if you say had, if you had, um, so for example, we were talking about the start of the match, those zip ties, if they're pointing out, would all need to be inside 50 centimeters. Similarly, at the, uh, at the event, it, they would also count as the greatest extent of your robot because they are part of your robot. If you had things that were a bit less malleable, I'm thinking, say, if you had a carrier bag hanging out the back, that might be a little grayer, because with that, that can depend quite a lot on the direction of the wind for all intensive purposes. That might get a bit more of a grayer line. 
Um, but that would also come down to a, we would work out what it is based on um, like when it happens. And then one of the things about rulings, the time of the competition is precedence does count. So if we allow something once, we will allow it every subsequent time, assuming the situation is the same. Okay, any questions online? Any more questions in the room? Yes. Let's ask on, on the age thing. Is there turning 16 by April? Is there stuff coming in with whether it's being part of the last 16? My understanding is if they are at the minimum age constraint at the time of the competition, it's okay. Let's have a chat later. Talk to the trustee. Uh, okay, any final questions? Um, you can still ask them throughout the day, come and talk to us. If you don't want to come and talk to us because we're too intimidating, ask them in Discord. If you're not in the room, you obviously can't talk to us, ask them in Discord. Um, we won't necessarily be monitoring YouTube chats and comments, so ask in Discord. If you're not in Discord, talk to your team leader. Uh, with that, and I jump back to the any questions slide, um, good luck. <laughs>